Uh, there's a lot of chatter about where where April seemed to be when she uh, was on her Zoom call. The background was really blurry, so I don't know uh, where that was, obviously. Uh, I hope the court doesn't find out. That would be so bad. <laughs> It'd just be terrible. It's, oh my God. Hopefully, hopefully. They never find out where, where that was because that would somehow affect something somewhere. But uh, but yeah, so here's what I figure. I figure, I figure, say, I can watch this thing. We can read this paper. We can talk about what happened. And I can give you guys maybe some insight that no one else can. But here we go. Um, charge of fifth degree possession. Uh, schedule one, two, three, four, not a small amount of marijuana, felony amount. Um, not a small amount of marijuana is the, uh, this is kind of a holdover of how the law was written because Minnesota had decriminalized marijuana. So if you had a small amount uh, for personal use prior to um, last year, I think it was, uh, then it was, it was a small amount was a non-criminal act. It was still a crime, but we don't have to get into it. But, uh, if you've got more than a small amount of marijuana, you had a felony. Now that part is really like, it's really not a small amount. They up the amounts quite a bit, but we don't need to get into that because she is uh, accused of possessing more than 0.25 grams of cocaine, which is what brings us into the felony level. If it's less than 0.25 grams of cocaine, it would be a misdemeanor or gross misdemeanor. I think eh, who cares? Uh, those uh, those almonds says, does April being charged lessen the burden of some quantity in yours and Kayla's cases below felony threshold, perhaps? Well, see, this is where it gets kind of tough to talk about things. Um, we'll have to see. Uh, Minnesota has a couple different theories of possession. And one of those theories is uh, joint possession. It's where multiple people can own all of something at the same time. And all of those people can be individually guilty or not guilty of owning a thing, any portion or all of it. Um, and one person can be guilty of owning 100% of it, and so can another. That's how joint ownership ends up working. It's kind of weird in, in concept. But part of the problem here is, uh, and this is what's brought up in, in the motion, is there's no particularity to the actual probable cause statement. So um, from this probable cause statement, we have to try and figure out what Actually, April is accused of possessing. So let's let's see if we can do it. The complainant states that the following facts establish probable cause. Your complainant is a licensed peace officer, uh, is employed by the Candy Ohio County Sheriff's Office. In this capacity, your complainant believes the following is true and correct. Who wrote this? Is this Brannis? Who wrote this one? Oh no, it's Kent Bauman. This is the chief deputy. This guy was at my house. He was walking around being chunky. Like when you're the chief deputy, you don't have to be as in good a shape as the other ones. Oh, that shape is almost universally round, to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys ever see SWAT? Remember how LL Cool J looked when he was all jacked out of his mind? He's got like a nine pack of abs. None of these guys look like this. Uh, all of these guys look like day old jelly donuts. Okay, so on May 23rd, 2024, at approximately 9.13 a.m., a search warrant was executed at... Oh, no, there's my, there's my house. Uh, <laughs> on me, on me uh, well, me and Kayla, reside at the residence. As law enforcement approached the residence, Nicholas was traveling southbound on 51st in a vehicle. I was traveling southbound on 51st in a vehicle. Uh, interestingly, I was not home. Nicholas Riccato was stopped by law enforcement. That is not quite true, actually. I'll tell you the real story, guys. I saw a fuckload of cars going by that all said sheriff on them, and I thought my house was being swatted. So I pulled over and stopped on my own. I was not stopped by law enforcement. Uh, when I stopped, I saw a law enforcement uh, car turn around and come back to me. So I waited for them there. I was, they act like they stopped me. These lazy asses didn't do shit. Upon knocking on the door, a juvenile female opened the door and wouldn't let me in. This is false. Straight out false. Uh, 
The juvenile female did not open the door at all. I don't know why they wrote that down, but okay. Nicholas Ricada would not provide the door code to enter the residence. That's true. I, I partly, I just said, show me the warrant and I'll give you the code. I'll walk you in myself. But they didn't, they didn't want to do that. I wasn't there, to be clear. Again, they, they kind of are, these complaints are written in this real muddy, muddy sort of way. And I'm not sure why, like they can't just write clearly about what happened, but law enforcement entered the home utilizing a door ram and a big boy wielding it. Upon entry, law enforcement located Kayla Riqueda and April Imholt and four juveniles were also in the home. That's not true either. Good job, guys. Got that one wrong as well. Uh, there were only three juveniles in the home. Kayla Riqueda and Imholt were located in the master bedroom. Officers noted the home was extremely cluttered. There were clothes everywhere, dirty dishes, dust, and an overall dirty home. It's almost like people live there. Nicholas Riqueda returned to the home with law enforcement. I returned to the home? I, I went to the home with law enforcement. He demanded a copy of search warrant. I forgot the article. The When given a copy, he looked at it and threw it on the ground. That's true. Uh, during the search, law enforcement located the following in the master bedroom. Following items are located in the master bedroom near the nightstand. This is interesting because this is a lot about me. <laughs> April is not the star of this show. Uh, yellow snort tube positive for cocaine. Black vial with white substance inside that field tested positive for cocaine and weighed 2.2 grams. That's a run-on sentence. Two credit cards listed to Imholt. The yellow snort tube and the black vial containing cocaine were found directly on top of the credit cards. Two 22 caliber spent shell casings on the floor of the nightstand in the master bedroom. Guys, one day I'm going to show you all about those shell casings. It's kind of funny. It's funny because they're like, ha, huh, we going to take your kids. And I'm like, that's, I don't even have a 22, you dumb fuckers. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just from art. The following item was located underneath the bed in the master bedroom. Six hour AR with several magazines and loose ammunition. Uh, serial number, whatever. Following item was located in the master bedroom dresser. Glass container with metal filter and grinder and glass container that field tested positive for cocaine. The following items were located in a safe in the master bathroom. Bag with cards and dollar bill that field tested positive for cocaine. Large corner cut baggie with white powder that field tested positive for cocaine and weighed 18.96 grams of packaging. Three small baggies that field tested positive for cocaine and weighed 5.49 grams of packaging. Eight green colored tablets that field tested positive for ketamine. Digital scale that field tested positive for cocaine. Metal pan with white powder on it that tested positive for cocaine. Two snort tubes and two metal cutters. Snort tubes tested positive for cocaine. Following items located in a safe in the master bedroom closet. This is all alleged by the county, by the way. I'm not admitting to any of this shit. These, uh, this is, this is their list. $100 bill with white powder residue that field tested positive for cocaine. Bindle white bag. It's a bindle white bag. With white powder substance that field tested positive for cocaine. Cocaine scooper. <laughs> so like a pooper scooper? Like, you know the things that you pick up dog shit with? Like, little claw thing? What's it? What is that? Two baggies with a baggie. Two baggies within a baggie with a funnel. That's confusing. Unknown brown substance. Oh, I hope it's poop. Additional firearms and ammunition were located in the garage. Imhold's purse was located in the hallway inside the master bedroom leading to the attached bathroom. The total amount of measurable cocaine in the master bedroom was 26.67 grams with packaging. It's a big package. Cocaine is a Schedule II controlled substance. Ketamine is a Schedule I controlled substance. That's not true. Ketamine is a Schedule III controlled substance. Good job, drug recognition experts and sheriff of the county that I'm in. Uh, Detective Pomplin, this guy's a winner, met with Nicholas Riqueda outside the residence. He was read his Miranda rights, and he agreed to speak to officer, with officers without counsel. Nicholas Riqueda indicated that he sleeps in the master bedroom with Kayla Riqueda. He indicated that Inholt was at the home visiting. Nicholas Riqueda and Kayla Riqueda were placed under arrest. While being placed under arrest, Detective Pomplin noted several injuries to the arms of Nicholas Riqueda that appeared consistent with sores that are common with controlled substance users. No, they did not. They were trans... It's funny because the one of the pictures that they have of my sores on my arms, the guy handcuffing me has a sore on his arm. Because some people get sores on their arms, but okay. They're transported to the Candy Ohio County Jail. Kayla did not speak with officers. At the Candy Ohio County Jail, Nicholas Riqueda was again read his Miranda rights. I got Miranda twice. 
and agreed to speak with officers without an attorney. Nicholas Riquet refused to answer any questions regarding cocaine or other controlled substance use. Nicholas Riqueda indicates that he lives in the residence. He stays in the master bedroom with his wife, Kayla Riqueda. Imhold was a friend who was visiting and does not live at the residence. While being booked into the jail, Kayla Riqueda requested that her prescription medication be brought to her. Upon reviewing the prescription bottles for Kayla Riqueda that were brought to the jail, jail staff found two unknown pills and gummies in one of the prescription bottles. Two unknown pills and gummies. Okay, both of those are plural, but they're different things. But there's two. It's confusing. These items did not match the prescription on the bottle. Kayla Riqueda informed child protection workers that Imholt is their live-in nanny. This is not a true statement by the, by the uh, drafting officer here. If you go back and read my complaint, this is, this is a fun game of uh, that insular telephone that we're talking about here. This is one of the instances where it happens. It happens in another place too, but... Um, Kayla did not inform a child protection worker that Imholt is a live-in nanny. A child protection worker asked Kayla, according to the other complaint, what the status of our live-in nanny, Cheney, actually, what the, stat what the status of our nanny was, our former nanny, um, Cheney, who she described as basically a live-in nanny. The CPS worker did. Kayla indicated that April was our nanny. And the CPS worker took that and made that into April being a live-in nanny. She did not say she was the live-in nanny because we have never had a live-in nanny, ever. Our former nanny was not a live-in nanny. April is not a live-in nanny. We don't have a bedroom for a live-in nanny. All our bedrooms are full of kids. So uh, that being said, um, this is one of those things, though. It gets put in the complaint that this is what is said. That's not what was said. That is what the CPS worker decided to label our former nanny as, even though she never lived in our home at all. She says, technically or basically, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's either technically or basically a live-in nanny. And then that gets put onto Kayla as her making this claim, but that didn't happen. But... Of course, now what has happened? The officers have used that statement in part as a basis for bringing this charge. So here we have a government worker. And again, this isn't, this isn't like this some malicious lie, right? This is some statement. I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not going to accuse her of that at this point. She lies in other places plenty of times. But giving her the benefit of the doubt, this is a statement where she's like, well, you guys have like a nanny or whatever, right? Like a live-in or something. And then uh says, that's not our nanny. Actually, April over there is our is our nanny. Uh, she replaced the former one. She goes, oh, so th the CPS worker goes, that's the live-in nanny and writes it down. That becomes now a fact. But it's not a real fact. It's great. So please take notice, pursuant to Minister Statute 609.49, intentional failure to appear for duly scheduled court appearances may result in additional criminal charges in addition to any arrest warrant that may otherwise be issued by the court. This is, this is weird because what do you guys see where the crime is? I know you can find, uh, you can try and find a crime like in these facts You can say, okay, well here, this might be a crime. This might be a crime. This might be a crime. Where's the actual accusation in this statement of probable cause? Now they say in her uh, in the complaint that she's accused of owning more than a quarter gram of cocaine. Well, they've got a couple different alleged sets of cocaine to choose from. Which one is it? And herein lies the problem. What is she accused of owning? So this is where you come into having the motion to dismiss, which I'll have to pull up because I uh, didn't grab it just a second ago. See if I can get it now. Oh. Oh. Why is case search down? Okay, so here we go. Uh, this is a motion to dismiss. The defendant, April, uh, through her attorney, Thomas Gallagher, and pursuant to Minnesota Rules of Criminal Procedure, 11.03, hereby moves to dismiss the complaint 
This motion is based on the files, records, and proceedings herein and on the following grounds. Complaint does not comply with Rules of Criminal Procedure 2.01. Complaint fails to allege facts amounting to probable cause to believe that an offense was committed. This actually, right here, is true. Because <laughs> it doesn't, it just doesn't say which facts actually show any kind of possession. Um, they leave a couple breadcrumbs, but... Uh, you know, the complaint fails to establish probable cause to believe the defendant committed an offense. There's another one. Like, even if you can find an offense committed in the in the fact pattern, it doesn't say that April uh, committed the offense. And then fourth, uh, further moves the court pursuant to Fifth and Sixth Amendments to the U.S. Constitution for an order dismissing the complaint for lack of sufficiency or in the alternative requiring the government to furnish defendant with a bill of particulars. Now, none of this was granted by the judge, but it doesn't matter. Like, again, um, the judge didn't order a bill of particulars, but the government does, or the state does clarify their position on what April is alleged to own in this, uh, in this case. So we actually do get some of that information out of this hearing. But here we go. So here's the rule. It sets forth the content requirements for complaints. Now, again, think back on the complaint we just read and see if it meets this in your opinion. Maybe it does. The complaint is a written signed statement of the facts establishing probable cause to believe that the charged offense has been committed and that the defendant committed it, except as modified by Rule 6.01, Subdivision 4. The probable cause statement can be supplemented by supporting affidavits, statements signed under penalty of perjury pursuant to Minnesota statutes, sections uh, 358.116, or by sworn witness testimony taken by the issuing judge. The complaint must specify the offense charged, the statute allegedly violated, and the maximum penalty the complaint must also conform to the requirements in Rule 17.02. And here's the comment to that rule. Because the complaint is accessible to the public and documents supporting the statement of probable cause can contain irrelevant material that is injurious to innocent third persons, as well as material prejudicial to the defendant's right to a fair trial, it is recommended, it is recommended that a statement be drafted containing the facts establishing probable cause in or with the complaint and the irrelevant material be omitted. Now, interestingly, most of this complaint is actually irrelevant, right? April is charged, uh, as we'll find out from the uh, the actual hearing, she's charged with owning this um, alleged 2.2 grams from a black vial located in the bedroom. The government did not allege that she was charged with uh, ownership of anything that was uh, allegedly pulled from the safe from the master bathroom, okay? So... In this now, we have a big question. Well, why the fuck do you talk about the safe and what's in it and all of the other stuff involving the house? Like, why is that relevant to April being charged with owning this one thing from one spot? In my opinion, this complaint does not conform to the rules. However, we get into the practicality part of it here, right? The practicality part is, are we achieving the goal now? Um, now there's more particularity to the allegation. The specific uh, alleged controlled substance has been identified. And now that uh, information is available to the defendant. So we've, we've achieved that goal through this hearing, even though we, the complaint, in my opinion, is facially deficient. Uh, the complaint alleges a criminal violation of felony possession of controlled substances, fifth degree, and contains two and a half page statement of probable cause alleging various facts to be true. Defendant's name is mentioned only five times in the statement of probable cause. I think some people have quibbled on this and said it's six. I didn't check. I don't care. Um, if it's five or six, it's still pretty, uh, pretty. Wow, the sixth one, that makes it reasonable. The statute charged requires unlawful possession. Uh, Minnesota statute 152.025 subdivision two parenthetical one, but the complaint does not allege uh, facts to be true that defendant unlawfully or otherwise possessed illegal drugs. It only says that she was a guest in someone else's home when police executed a search warrant and found illegal drugs. Accordingly, since the complaint contains no factual substantiation or probable cause, it must be dismissed. It's important to note that this, the complaint doesn't say she is in possession of anything in there. Like it, they just don't say it, which is weird. I don't know why they didn't just write that down. Like if you're going to allege that she's in possession of uh, of a thing, which is you're charging her with the crime of it. I think it's safe to allege it. You can't, you don't have to be scared. Like 
They should just write it. But it's just bad writing. Probable cause exists when a person of ordinary care and prudence viewing the totality of circumstances objectively would entertain an honest and strong suspicion that a specific individual has committed a crime. Again, it has to be a specific individual and a specific act. A person's mere proximity to criminal activity does not in and of itself establish probable cause to arrest. Since the complaint makes no allegation the defendant possessed any illegal drugs, but merely she was present in the same in the house, the same house, it should be dismissed for lack of probable cause. Uh, the Fifth and Sixth Amendments require that a complaint sufficiently apprise the defendant of what he must be prepared to meet. This is Russell v. U.S. This is uh, this is well-established criminal procedure case law is what he's going to go through with uh, Russell and Hernandez, uh, Wessel. These are all uh, like landmark cases in this um, coming through. Well, some of these are coming through the appeals courts. Others, uh, Russell here, Supreme Court. The complaint provides insufficient information to allow a defendant to form a defense and should be dismissed. At a minimum, she's entitled to a bill of particulars ordering the government to clarify the charges with details sufficient for her to understand and respond to them. A bill of particulars serves to inform the defendant of the nature of the charge against him with sufficient precision to enable him to prepare for trial, to avoid or minimize the danger of surprise, <laughs> if you say surprise, uh, at trial, and enable him to plead his acquittal or conviction in bar of another prosecution for the same offense when the complaint is too vague and indefinite. U.S. v. Hernandez, see also U.S. v. Wessel. The district court, in its discretion, may order the government to provide requested additional detail where the particulars set out in the complaint fail sufficiently to apprise the defendant of the charges to enable him to prepare a full defense. That's U.S. v. Garrett. The complaint alone will be sufficient when the elements of the offense are delineated and the general statement is accompanied by specific facts constituting the offense. That's uh, U.S. v. Hellmel. Uh, it's axiomatic that a defendant is entitled to know what behavior is alleged to constitute the defense he is charged with. Uh, U.S. versus Idris. And then um, that's uh, ordering a bill of particulars detailing the elements of the three counts of the specific facts establishing those offenses. The defendant, for the reasons, respectfully requests the court grant her motion to dismiss the complaint for lack of probable cause. And that's signed by Thomas Gallagher. Okay. Sorry, we kind of burned through that. But um, this is just an outright uh shot across the bow right like you're not doing your job well there's a whole lot of reasons that the that the da may not be doing their job well da i say da it's county attorney assistant county attorney but the assistant county attorney may not be doing their job well for a lot of things. Like I won't get too deep into speculation. I know you guys are smart and will figure out some reasons why that might be, but I have reasons to not talk about it. Unfortunately, boring, but um, there are some reasons why this just might not be a well-drafted complaint. And uh, frankly, this, this motion kind of sets the tone, right? Hey, Let's get fucking gear here. Like, let's, let's figure this out. You can't just generally allege some criminal activity has occurred without saying what it actually was. Hit the like button. And be like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fuck you, Doom. Goodbye. I'll do it like that show. Goodbye. Good, good, yeah. Shut up, Doom. And don't you dare clip this, you son of a bitch. I'd be careful about that Doom guy. Doom's a weirdo. By the way, if you listen to anything that Doom guy says, you're probably listening to a mentally retarded person. Doom, you're gone again. That's it. I'm so sick of you anyway.